Good morning and welcome to Sabbath School today. Shall we begin with prayer? Dear Father in heaven, we ask that you'll guide us and bless us today. Our purpose is to see the special insights from Romans that the 1888 message points us to. And this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. This is lesson number 11 in our studies in the book of Romans, entitled The Elect. Paul, we're told, was the God-appointed apostle to the Gentiles, and his heart was certainly set on the salvation of his fellow Jews. We read this in Romans 10, verse 1. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. It is good to be zealous in the work of God. The problem is, like so many today, a preacher wants to run off as fast as he can to the next appointment, and when he gets there, he has no good news for the, from the Lord. In 10 verse 2, Paul writes, For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. And so the correct knowledge of God becomes a key theme throughout these two chapters. The ignorance of the Jews centers on God's way of justification. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going out about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. The Jews have tried to make themselves morally right through their self-inspired zeal. However, they have taken a detour around Christ. The vital knowledge necessary for being straightened out is by faith in Christ. According to verse 4, For Christ is the end of the law, for righteousness to everyone that believeth, he says. And so the endless debates centering on the word end are all futile in their efforts to do away with the law of God. It's contrary to Christ who came to establish the law. The ultimate point or thing at which the law directs its view, the object intended to be reached, or accomplished is righteousness and Christ is the only righteous one having faced the incessant temptations of the flesh and defeating them the law will not falsely uh, verify the facts it is a perfect description of righteousness the law was given for life-giving purposes man sinned and he could not keep the law Romans 10, 5, For Moses describeth the righteousness which is of the law, that the man which doeth those things shall live by them. So any theory of justifying man's sin by a book transaction, which bypasses a change of heart and reconciliation to God and his law, is a legal fiction and rightly termed an anti-law gospel. It is the understanding which Christians have given to Muslims about how forgiveness of sins is obtained, and they consider it a fraud and hypocrisy. Now, God has not forgotten his purposes for the Jewish people. The early Christian church was formed with the nucleus of Jewish believers, Paul being prominent among them. In Romans 11, verse 1, he writes, I say then, Hath God cast away his people? God forbid. For I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. Again, Paul will cover the ground of chapter 9 regarding those who were no people, yet included in the everlasting covenant. Verse 2, God hath not cast away his people, which he foreknew. What ye not, what the scripture saith of Elijah how he maketh intercession to God against Israel, saying, Now Elijah, we remember, stood as a lone figure on Mount Carmel at the time of Israel's well-nigh complete apostasy into Baal worship. And Elijah pleaded with the Lord in despair. Verse 11, chapter 11, verse 3, Lord, they've killed thy prophets and dig down thine altars. And I alone am left, and they seek my life. Elijah felt alone in the crisis amidst the church of Israel. It was Elijah's cross experience 
Well, just because you can't see any visible means of encouragement and support doesn't mean that there isn't a true remnant. In Romans 11:4, Paul writes, But what saith the answer of God unto him? I have reserved to myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. Now where were these 7,000 when Elijah needed them to support him? Evidently, they weren't willing to step forward at the showdown on Mount Carmel. It took one man, Elijah, to bring about a revival and reformation to Israel. It must be the cross uplifted in order to for the hearts of Israel to be turned to God. And unless the preacher himself experienced the cross, his message would have been fruitless. If there had been any self in Elijah's, Elijah, it would have suited Satan's purposes and certainly would have muted Elijah's message of the cross. The purpose of Paul's illustration here of Elijah and the 7,000 is to frame the Gentiles as the remnant according to the election of grace. We read this in Romans 11:5. Even so then, at this present time also, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. Now grace is God's favor to the most unfavorable. God's foreknowledge elected the Gentiles to be saved in Christ, as foreshadowed in the writings of Moses and the experience of Elijah. If God's grace were given on the basis of merit, then it would not be grace. But the mere fact that it is freely given to all, including the Gentiles, establishes the fact that grace is a gift. Romans 11:6. And if by grace, then it is no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then it is no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. The Gentiles weren't seeking after God, much less motivated to work for his favor, as were the Jews, who were seeking to get their father's attention. There is such enslaving blindness in the self-centered motivation of seeking after God for a reward that Christ is completely blocked out. Romans 11:7. what then? Israel hath not obtained that which he seeketh for, for the election hath obtained it, and the rest were blinded. So Paul flat out states what Israel's problem is. He's seeking. And there is the self-motivation. The only miracle now that could prevent the complete and utter collapse of the Jews' salvation is to see something that they've never seen before. Chapter 11, verse 11, I say then, hath they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid. But rather through their fall, salvation is come unto the Gentiles for to provoke them to jealousy. What God believes will happen for the Jew is that they will see his love, see he loves them in such a selfless way as demonstrated at the cross, just as he loves the Gentiles and gives them salvation through Jesus' sacrifice. And such divine love for the Gentiles will provoke the jealousy of his Israelites. Paul is beside himself with the good news of much more abounding grace. He just cannot contain himself. In chapter 11, verse 12, Now if the fall of them be the riches of the world, and the diminishing of them the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness. God's purposes of salvation to all men is never diminished by the failure of the Jewish-based Jewish mission Christ has broken the treasure chest of heavenly riches for the Gentile-based mission, and there is going to be a tsunami-like effect upon the Jews. Paul may understand his apostolic office to be primarily for the Gentiles, but his fellow Jews are never far from his heart. In chapter eleven, thirteen, For I speak to you Gentiles... Inasmuch as I am the apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify my office. Paul has a unique ministry to bridge the culture gap that exists between Jew and Gentile. Mission impossible becomes mission possible only by uplifting the cross of Christ, which unites 
all peoples, Jew and Gentile. And it will be a two-for-one success if Paul's Gentile mission could provoke the Jews to salvation, if they could witness the grace of God working in the lives of Gentiles, it might grab their attention. Chapter eleven, fourteen: If by any means I may provoke to emulation them which were, are my flesh and might save some of them, the, the shame and nakedness that comes from Old Covenant-inspired Jewish religion, might be put in stark contrast with the sunlight New Covenant grace and love that is saving the Gentiles. Paul is living in tumultuous times for the church. How to understand the church in perspective with the church of ancient Israel. His resolution to the continuity of both churches of the Old and the New Testaments is to view it as God's plan all along that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself. Jewish unbelief in Christ frustrated that unstoppable grace. Because of their choice of necessity, the progress of the gospel must not be hindered. Chapter eleven fifteen. For if the casting away of them be the reconciling of the world, what shall the receiving of them be but life from the dead? The problem with Jewish unbelief in Christ is that it results in separation from God and ultimately death. What is the remedy for spiritual death? Verse 16, for if the first fruit be holy, the lump is also holy. And if the root be holy, so are the branches. And so the answer is found in the illustration of the good tree. Christ is the olive tree. Everything that is connected with him, who is the root, everything, the olives, the knob, and the branches, is holy. The Old Testament church was connected to Christ. However, some of its branches were broken off because of unbelief in Christ. He says this in similar words, And if some of the branches be broken off, and thou, being a wild olive tree, were grafted in among them, and with them partakest of the root, and fatness of the olive tree, so contrary to nature, a wild olive tree branch, the Gentiles, is grafted in to the good olive tree. And there it receives of the root and the fatness of Christ. And so Paul writes to the Jews, don't ridicule the broken Jewish branches. Verse 18, boast not, he says, against the branches. But if thou boastest, thou bearest not the root but the root thee. Gentiles, he says, you are not the load-bearing stock of the tree. Christ is the root of you. The broken branches were removed because the arborist saw they were dead. You Gentiles may perceive it as God's purpose of making room for you to be grafted into Christ. Verse 19, thou wilt say then, the branches were broken off that I might be, that I might be grafted in. The real reason that the branches died was because of unbelief. Well, he says, verse 20, because of unbelief they were broken off, and thou standest by faith. Be not high-minded, but fear. The reason, he says, you Gentiles were grafted in was because of faith motivated by Christ's love. Don't revert to the default position of self-love, but continue in that love. The law of pruning says if something is no, is no longer growing, it is dead, and remove it. For if God spared not the natural branches, take heed, lest he also spare not thee. Remember history. Don't let unbelief overtake you. Don't lose your first love. God always makes something good out of a bad situation. Verse 22. Behold, therefore, the goodness and severity of God on them which fell severity, but toward thee goodness. If thou continuest in his goodness, otherwise thou also shalt be cut off. It is the goodness of God which leadeth thee to repentance. The Lord is good to all, and his tender mercies are over all his works. Psalm 145 verse 9. The Lord is goodness himself. He is love. He cannot at any time be any other than he is. 
and therefore he is just as good to one person as he is to another. He's equally good to everybody and just as good as he can be all the time. Therefore it is not because they have not been drawn by the love of God that some are destroyed. It is because they have despised that love. Having hardened their hearts against God's love, the more he manifested his love to them, the harder they became. It is a trite saying that the same sun that melts the wax hardens the clay. This is from E.J. Wagner in The Present Truth, February 23, 1893. And so Paul envisions a regrafting of the dead branches when the Jews believe in the root. Romans 11:23 and they also if they abide not still in unbelief shall be grafted in he says for God is able to graft them in again the unnatural process of grafting from a wild to a good olive tree is a miracle of God's grace to the gentiles for if thou were cut out of the olive tree which is wild by nature and were grafted contrary to nature into a good olive tree how much more shall these, which be the natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree? Likewise, the regrafting process of the dead branches again to the good olive tree is a miracle of God's grace. The good olive tree represents the mystery of the gospel, which is abide in me and I in you. There is nothing more sad than a flourishing tree which has been blighted by disease and trimmed to a hideous shadow of its former greatness. For I would not, brethren, he says in verse 25, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits. That blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles become in. It is the engrafting of the Gentiles which supplies the perfect fullness of the good olive tree. It restores its majestic appearance and fruitfulness. The Gentile engraftment project is so that all Israel shall be saved. Verse 26, And so all Israel shall be saved. As it is written, There shall come out of Zion the Deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. The same power that delivered Israel out of Egypt is the same power that delivers us from bondage to sin. And now Gentiles are considered the household of Jacob. So there you have the whole story. The coming in of the fullness of the Gentiles. The filling up of the number of Israel. The conversion of both Jews and Gentiles. How shall all Israel be saved? By the coming in of the Gentiles. And then will Israel be full. And the blindness will have passed away. Christ the Deliverer turns away ungodliness from Jacob. By saving Gentile sinners as well as sinners of the Jews, writes E.J. Wagner, Present Truth, March 20, 1902. God's covenant is for all. The forgiveness of sins in Christ's righteousness is to straighten us out, contemplate the preparation to meet him. Verse 27, for this is my covenant unto them when I shall take away their sins. What a wonderful promise. The Gentiles who believe in Christ experience an enemy status so far as the Jews are concerned. Verse 28, As concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sakes, but as touching the election, they are beloved for the Father's sakes. Nevertheless, God's election of the Jews in his everlasting covenant has not been revoked. It was that covenant promise which, gave to their, which he gave to their patriarchs. The salvation in Christ which God has given in the covenant and God's effectual calling of every Jew by name is continuous and unrelenting, but not irresistible. Verse 29, for the gifts and the calling of God are without repentance. God has not rolled over on his promise. Historically, you Gentiles were classified non-believers, for as ye in times past have not believed God, yet have now obtained mercy through their unbelief. Romans 11.30 Presently, the Jewish classification as non-believers means good to you Gentiles, so you may partake of the root and fatness of Christ 
and fill out the good olive tree. It is still God's purpose to sta- change the status of Jewish non-believers into believers. Verse 31, Even so have these also now not believed that through your mercy they also may obtain mercy. Mercy is undeserved and unmerited, but nonetheless given unstintingly to souls who are in desperate need. So the bottom line, as far as God is concerned, is that we are all, both Jew and Gentile, born into this world in a state of unbelief. For God hath concluded them all, he says in verse 32, in unbelief, that, they might, that he might have mercy upon all. And it is God's mercy that gives faith to all. Since God does not have a merit system, it is by his gift and not an offer that we are saved. So we would never have arrived at this knowledge of God without divine revelation. The riches spoken of, the wisdom and knowledge of God are comprehended in the cross of Christ, which is the sacrifice for the sinners of this world. Oh, he says in verse 33, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. Again, there is an overwhelming sense that God's ways of reaching humanity are beyond human devising. It is indeed God's work, and he is the one who will finish it. Dear Father in heaven, we pray that Jesus will come soon. If you want us to have a part in that work, then we wish to submit to your purposes as Gentiles in order to uplift the cross of Jesus, that those who were promised originally uh, the covenants and everlasting salvation might have it through the cross of Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen.